Hey, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. Savvy Painter is the podcast for painters who know that mastering your craft is a lifelong venture. They understand that the hardest part is showing up every day, whether they're inspired or not, and that we're all in this together. For the past three years, the Savvy Painter podcast has been sharing tips and techniques that you can use every day in your studio. And when you join the Savvy Painter email list now, you get a collection of inspiring quotes and practical advice collected from years of Savvy Painter interviews. Just go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe to sign up for weekly emails and get your free PDF essential tips for artists. Each week, I interview established artists like Ann Gale, Scott Connery, Rebecca Crowell, and many other artists who are willing to open their studio doors, share their painting processes, and talk candidly about what it takes to consistently grow your skills. We get into the nitty gritty of their daily studio practice, what tricks they play on themselves to avoid getting caught up in perfectionism, how to use flashcards as reminders to stay on track during long painting sessions, and other cool tactics to quiet the inner critic and continue moving towards excellence. The Savvy Painter Podcast is filled with artists who generously share their stories, and by sharing their stories, they show the rest of us that we are not alone. So join us with the Savvy Painter email list and get even more connected with weekly emails. Sign up now and you get essential tips for artists, the inspiring quotes and practical advice collected from years of Savvy Painter interviews. Go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. It's that easy. Noah Buchanan is my guest this week. Noah studied classical painting and drawing at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, and he received a Bachelor of Arts from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and later went on to earn his master's from the New York Academy of Art. His work is based in the academic tradition of the figure. Noah is attracted to images where there is a divine force or a mythological reference. He favors themes of the symbolic and heroic. In this episode, Noah tells the story of how a retrospective of the French painter Valentin de Bouillon pushed him to create the large-scale multi-figure work that he'd always wanted to tackle but had avoided. He sort of got permission to try these massive paintings from the old masters themselves. As he studied their work, he realized something profound. They made mistakes too. At some point, they struggled and learned from their challenges. When we see their work from an historical standpoint, meaning we have the advantage of hindsight, we can see all the great work they did and ignore the beginnings where they struggled a little bit. It's easy to overlook the fact that they were humans and not gods. Intellectually, we all know that. But when we stand in front of a canvas in our own studio, it's really easy to forget it. Noah and I also talk about where he gets his models, what makes a good model, and why using photographs is not actually cheating. So please enjoy this conversation with Noah Buchanan. Noah, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I'm excited to talk with you today. Thank you, and Teresa. It's it's really a thrill to be on Savvy Painter. I've been listening and really in awe of the, the company you've kept on this podcast. Thank you. Can you tell me about when you started painting? I would love to hear about some of the early influences that made you want to, that got you interested in becoming an artist. Well, for me, it was more about drawing for sure early on. And that started super early. I was, you know, around even like five and six. And, and I think that it was just from looking at comic book illustrations and superheroes and being interested in Star Wars as a kid and making a lot of drawings of that kind of subject matter. But uh, as I got into high school, I was looking at imagery principally from, I'd say, Albrecht Durer and drawings and paintings by Michelangelo. And and those were the first kind of big, you know, very art historical uh, figures that made me really want to, to start making artwork in a more serious way, other than just for kind of sake of my own entertainment as a kid. Mm-hmm. Durer was that's that's impressive that you were looking at him in in high school. Well, I had I had a great art teacher, and this was I went my last two years of high school were in Southwest Florida, and he had a great classroom, and and he had a bunch of art historical images around the classroom, and one of these was an engraving by Albrecht Durer, and it was it was Saint Jerome in the wilderness, and it says it was an, a wood engraving of an old man kneeling in the wilderness, and just. Something about that image, it really sparked a lot of things for me that that are still with me. But 
yeah, there he was, and Durer was right there, and and uh, Michelangelo's Sistine ceiling. The uh, uh, image, images of the Sistine ceiling were also in that classroom, and really became just I became really passionate about those all of those things. What are some of the things that that have stuck with you about Durer's work? I think composition maybe was a big thing, and you know I, maybe bigger than that though is just the feeling of mythology. And the divine and and those two major elements coming together, coming to interface with with a mortal figure. And that's that's still with me today as like a principal motif and content in my work is is that feeling of the interface between the divine or the mythological and just the human. And I, I see that a lot in or at least the implication of that in a lot of Durer's work. Mm, yes. For people who've never seen your work before, how would you describe it? Well, I work mostly in oil paint and I paint the figure mostly, although I've, you know, I've definitely put many, many hours and many years into painting still life and, and landscape. But the figure is definitely my primal interest. And it's a very an anatomical approach to the figure. You know, so in other words, understanding anatomy, the, the musculoskeletal system of the of the human figure and then approaching it in paint in the way that uh, 17th century painters would do so artists like van dyck rubens and i should say both both 16th and 17th century painters so i, I would include caravaggio for sure and rubens mm-hmm. and, and certainly velasquez and using the paint in a way that that tries to champion behaviors of the flesh and 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 of the anatomical system of the figure so I really love, I love it. There's the, a very simple behavior in oil paint where the light mass on a on a figure is very transparent. I'm, I'm sorry, very opaque, very opaque and full bodied, and the shadow is very transparent and earth tone and and the dichotomy of those two relationships really have always excited me from the first time I noticed that in figure painting and and started trying to do that myself. Just was very exciting to me. So yeah. that's. That's something that I think people tend to notice a lot in in my paintings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's so, it's so much fun to play with. It's just so juicy. Exactly. How do you choose your your motif? For me, that it's the as I was talking about with the Durer influence earlier and Michelangelo and and so many others, but I re- have always loved it when I feel like there is some major divine force at play in the image or a, a mythological element that that is presenting themselves to this you know sort of mere mortal figure and and their interaction between the two so i always look for some feeling of that in in the painting even if it's a still life you know or if it's a landscape but i'm always looking for some feeling of that interaction or a conversation between those two forces mm-hmm. so like I've, I've got a big thing going on in the studio right now that i'm sitting in front of and that's definitely happening in, in that image there's a, a mythological figure there to you know interact with with human beings and but then i think that i really love the way that the what i just talked about with the behavior of the paint the, op- the opaque lights the transparent shadows i love that interaction as also being consistent with that idea that that you've got this this light mass, which is like you said, juicy and full of color and impasto paint and texture, detail, all all of the the sort of sublime stuff happens in the light mass. And then on the other side, the shadow mass is kind of like the poor, the poor struggling human condition where it's it's transparent, it's earth tone, it's thin and washy, and it's like it's struggling to keep up, you know. And so, oh, that's a great analogy. I love it. Thank you. Well, I, I mean, I. I can't take credit for it. it. It comes from, you know, from a lot of these 16th and 17th century painters. You can see them very aware of that, those kind of ideas when they're painting the figure. So the piece that you mentioned, you sent me an image of this piece that you're currently working on. And both my husband and I were looking at it just going, whoa. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And my husband usually doesn't, doesn't, you know, like he's, he appreciates art, but he doesn't get as, he doesn't geek out on it nearly anywhere near the extent that I will. So But I'm so curious, how big is that piece? And can you can you talk a little bit more about why you started working that and what what it means to you? Oh, yeah, it's that's like, you know, every artist wants to talk about what they're working on right now, like from musicians to actors to painters, you know, so I'm happy to talk about it. 
So it's an oil painting on linen and it's 80 inches by 62 inches wide. So it, it allows for the figures to be life-size figures, uh-huh. which is large for me. I think I've, I've done life-size before with like a single figure or a portrait, but this is the first where it's... This is intense. This one looks really intense. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad it comes across that way. It, it came about because I went to, I, I try to go to New York as much as I can. I love New York City. They were having a show at the Met on a 17th century painter named Valentin de Bouillon. I don't know his work. Yeah, I didn't either. And it turns out he's he's a Caravaggisti, so, you know, very influenced by, by Caravaggio's chiaroscuro and everything that he did. And he worked principally in Rome, even though he was he was a French French artist, but he was, you know, active in Rome at the time. And they did this huge retrospective of his of his work and I and my and so many other people were just blown away by canvas after canvas of really large multi-figure compositions. And, you know, sometimes the canvases were just, they're just packed full of figures, like, you know, 10, 20 figures, all engaged in kind of swirling, dramatic, chaotic Mm -hmm. activity. And he was so prolific, you know, that the number of paintings he made is just staggering and they're all huge canvases. And and they deal with the subject matter that I really love, which is principally, you know, Greco-Roman mythology and also biblical narrative. And so I was standing in front of his paintings and I just thought, I, I just said to myself, it's way overdue that you've tackled this, you know, as I'm saying to myself. And I, I had, it's what I had wanted to do when I went into art school. I mean, I, I knew that. I said, well, I'm going to paint multiple figure compositions that have these big narrative ideas behind them and tap into an older historical tradition. And as I got out of art school and graduate school, what I proceeded to do was basically paint kind of maybe career safe still lives, portraits, certainly lots of figure paintings. But, you know, I kept it on the sort of the less risky side, like like single figure paintings. Were you doing that intentionally because you thought that's what people wanted? Or was there, or were you just kind of like, eh, I don't know if I want to tackle that quite yet? Yeah, I think I think it was kind of all of those things. I was definitely a little bit afraid to to do it, that it wouldn't work out, you know, that I knew that there was, there's definitely risks involved compositionally, spatially within a picture. Can you handle that many figures interacting? And there's a high likelihood that you fall on your face, you know, trying to make a big ambitious painting like that. Mm -hmm. I also was, I think, playing it safe for thinking about the gallery and thinking about what a painting sell or not. And also just uh, logistically, like, could I make a lot of paintings that would be, you know, that would create a big body of work for myself and that I could have a solo show in a gallery with. And, and I thought, well, you know, if I do a huge ambitious multi-figure painting, I'm not going to be able to make a lot of paintings, you know, and I won't Mm. have the body of work. So I think, I think all of those reasons kind of led me to, to play it safe for many years after becoming a, an actual professional painter. So seeing these paintings at the Met, that, is that what pushed you over the edge, so to speak? (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. And I just turned 40 and I was standing in front of these paintings at the Met and I just thought, this is way overdue. I should have done this 10 years ago. And I thought, and I really, I was ready to do it 10 years ago, but I maybe just a little hesitant for all the reasons we just went through. Mm -hmm. And on the plane ride home from that, I had my sketchbook out and I was, and I was whipping out little thumbnail sketches for what would become this painting that's just about wrapped up on in my studio right now. So it's, I'm really excited about it because it's, I'm happy the way it's come out. It's impressive. Oh, thanks. That means a lot because it's, you know, I haven't really, I've, I've shared it with the public in terms of like Instagram and Facebook, but it hasn't been like officially unveiled or anything. So (laughs) (laughs) keeping my fingers crossed, but just kind of giving it my all. And, you know, there were a lot of revelations I think that came about from looking at this painter, Valentin de Bouillon. I definitely, I bought the book from the, from the gift shop after the show and was studying it very closely on the way home. And I still have it here on my, on one of the desks in my studio. And what I noticed that kind of took away all the fear out of the whole the whole f- process and formula and equation of making a, a multiple figure composition is that there was a lot of errors in a lot of these master paintings, mm. and I think that we actually don't we don't tend to notice them. I'll give you an example of one that you know on, on closer inspection of one of these paintings I noticed was that a, a figure in the foreground was 
a little bit too small compared to a figure in the background, you know, of one of these paintings that have like 10 to 20 figures in them. And, and I went around looking at all, a lot of other masters for that kind of stuff, Rembrandt, Velasquez, Caravaggio. And when you're looking for it, you'll find it everywhere. And, and so realizing that the, the old masters made these mistakes too, Mm -hmm. just erased all these fears in my mind that I could, I could go ahead and do it. And then if I had those problems, if I did make those mistakes for those failures, it was okay. (laughs) You know, that it, it shouldn't stop me or prevent me from trying or from making the painting anyway. I so agree with that. I absolutely applaud that revelation. (laughs) That is so great because the power of the work comes from, from the work itself and the technicality is, I mean, of course it's important, but our minds are happy to sort of overlook that or maybe even not notice it right. when the image itself is really powerful and resonates on a, on a very human level. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the thing. Uh, you know, another example of that. And, and I think the kind of the root of, of my inspiration for, for these kind of paintings, even before this, even before Valentin de Bouillon came along was Velasquez and specifically his painting called Los Barachos, which is Bacchus having wine with all of the vineyard workers, which is the, the same. Yeah, the drunkards. <laughs> exactly. And it's the same subject matter I'm doing in this painting. So I'm, this is my, my homage to, to his Los Barachos. But <laughs> I was reading uh, in one of the books on Velasquez and his paintings, I was reading about it. And, and the author criticizes that painting as, you know, amongst all of its successes, the author criticizes the painting as not having a good spatial organization and that it it would not be plausible for all of these figures to fit into this tiny space that they're all crammed into. And I kind of, I was kind of like, boy, the audacity of that author to say that, (laughs) you know, like this, to me, this work is sacred and, you know, it's like blasphemy to say that. But, but then I looked at it again and I thought, I guess, you know, I guess the author has a point and come to think of it, that kind of problem happens in a lot of these master paintings. And, I, that whole thing, just realizing that was so liberating to me that I could just forge ahead and go ahead and make those mistakes, you know, and, and sometimes you you will make those mistakes and sometimes you won't, but you have to just keep trying painting after painting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's the big process right there is the trying out, painting after painting. Yeah. But I'm, I'm kind of, I always wonder this. I'm curious if, what do you think? Do you think Velasquez... Did that knowingly or do you think knowingly meaning like, okay, I know I'm, I'm f- taking some artistic license here because I want this particular thing to work. Mm-hmm. Or do you think he just hadn't figured that out yet? It's kind of a, a guessing game. I think on that, I could, I could see either way. I mean, for one thing's for sure is he definitely pulls it off, you know, obviously mm-hmm. whatever the outcome it's, you know, it's definitely a brilliant, brilliant genius thing that he does. And I I think on the other hand, there's a definitely a lack of any kind of evidence that he did studies or drawings in his paintings. So it's very likely that he kind of worked these paintings out right on the canvas. And I, and I think that when artists do that, they are more prone to have those kind of problems like spatial plausibility between figures. So I think some of it is with him, it's genuine mistake or just faltering and some of it is, you know, maybe he was completely in control of what he was doing all the way through. But I, again, that idea of just kind of um, of knowing that these guys could allow themselves to make mistakes and not be perfect, that that, that kind of said, OK, yeah, well, it's time to, like, get busy with with these more serious paintings now. Yeah, we can. I mean, I don't know if I can actually say that we can take them off the pedestal, but <laughs> right. It helps, though. <laughs> yeah. If yeah. They're, they're not so lofty then they feel graspable, you know, and that we could just dream of aiming for that. Right, right. I'm curious from your your work, what memorable responses have you had to it? Because you've got some some really powerful stuff. I'm wondering if there's anything that comes to mind when, you know, showing your work, a particular reaction that stands out. You know, one of the, I think one of the most special ones that stays with me and I've heard this. I've heard this from other artists that ha- have made or do actively make sacred artwork, which is artwork for a church. Is that you get some reactions there, or or some interactions with your work that you're never going to see 
in a gallery. Mm. And uh, like one of the artists I'm thinking of is, is a contemporary painter in Southern California. He lives in Ojai named John Nava. And he, he did this huge, huge epic altar pieces for the, for the Los Angeles cathedral. And I was visiting him there at the cathedral and he was showing me his, his tapestries and, and talking about the process of making them. And he was there when the, when the church was just kind of still in heavy construction mode, like, like, you know, wow. all kinds of iron girding around and, and he had to go down and meet the architect and plan out where these tapestries were going to go. And he was there the day they brought in the the corpus, you know, which is the figure of, of Christ on the cross. They brought it into the church to plan out where it would go on the altar. And all the workmen came down off the scaffolding, came down to actively pray at the base of the corpus in the church. And I think John said something like the architect turned to him and said, boy, you're never going to see that in the gallery. Yeah. And, and so... You know, so it's a very different thing. So, I, so anyway, I've had the opportunity to make paintings for the church in the past. I made two really large altarpiece paintings for the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And I get emails on a fairly, fairly regular basis just from abroad from people who have who have made pilgrimages to that cathedral. And they express these just incredibly sweet and honest and and very spiritually meaningful feelings in their emails. And, you know, somebody said that they took their newborn and held it up in front of one of the paintings I had made for a blessing from the saint that was depicted in the painting. And that was a whole nother level, you know, hearing that. Yeah. That was just like, uh, whoa, that's different from like me painting a still life and, you know, someone saying, oh gosh, you know, that fruit is so, so delicious looking. It feels like I could just take the, you know, the pear out of the bowl. And like, that's, that's wonderful too. I love hearing that, <laughs> but, but this was a whole nother level, you know, oh, yeah, that, that people were using your work as a spiritual vehicle. And, you know, that, that was really meaningful to me. You know, to be honest, it doesn't surprise me that they would use your work for as a spiritual vehicle, what surprises me is they took the time to find out who the artist is, to be honest, because usually, right. you know, when you go into a church, you're there for obviously for a very specific reason. And it's not your normal person. It's not to look at the art. The art right. is there for the purpose that they're there for, whether it's, you know, they're, they're going there in times of trouble or for reflection or whatever. But mm -hmm. I'm just so impressed that they they tracked you down. Yeah, that is really nice. And I, I think there, what, what you said is true. There's a lot of times the artists and artists work in a church, uh, unless you're walking around Rome and you're like, you know, purposely looking for mm -hmm. Caravaggio's altarpieces. And a lot of times the artist's work kind of gets maybe overshadowed by the church itself. So you, you, you'll see the sculpture in the paintings, but you just, you sort of attach it to the church and you maybe don't look for who did this piece. So yeah, it is, it is really rewarding when when they take the time to to track you down to to ask you about about the paintings or just express some meaningful experience they had with your painting. Yeah, that's I mean, to me that's that's the most incredible thing about your story. <laughs> I mean, and you know, of course as I don't know, flattering is the right word, but it is it is gratifying to know that people respond to your work to that degree. Yeah. Yeah, very flattering, very flattering. I would love to hear a little bit about your personal successes, was there a moment or a decision you made that you feel like was a personal success? Oh, boy. Well, let's think about this for a second here. Because, you know, I think that's a great question because I think a lot of painters, I don't know, I, I have a feeling a lot of painters, when we look at our the road behind us. <laughs> There's probably a lot of us just kicking ourselves going, oh, why didn't I take that opportunity? Or why did I move here? Or, well, you know, why did I go with this gallery, not that gallery when I had the choice? I, that's definitely the case for me. I definitely kind of maybe beat myself up a bit internally in terms of choices and decisions and paths not taken. And and I think sometimes things that are that are successes can be like a blessing and a curse. You know, they can mm. be they have their upsides and their downsides. I think it was a really a, one thing I would never change is that I made the decision to go to the New York Academy in Manhattan for grad school, and I I went there principally to study with a woman named Martha Mayer Erlbacher. She was teaching there at the time, and I, I went there to study with her, and I became very close with her. 
both personally and then also just as as her student. And I learned so much from Martha about painting, about aesthetics and meaning and content in work, and also about anatomy. She taught me a lot of anatomy, which I, I is still a huge part of what I do in my work and in my teaching. That just being in New York and then being able to study with Martha really opened open doors and paths that I, I have not regretted. So that that's that's a big one that I really cherish, you know, a decision or something that happened. Mm, I love that. That's so great. Another one that I've that I've always been happy about is that when I got out of grad school, which I realized later was very rare, somebody offered to introduce me to John Pence in San Francisco Mm -hmm. of John Pence Gallery. And, you know, and I really jumped at that opportunity and, and John agreed to start showing my work at that time. This was in 2004. And I just, I just been out of grad school about a year and was starting to think about finding a gallery and so that worked out. And I think that that's kind of an example of like maybe the blessing and the curse. I think that showing with John was a, an amazing, wonderful opportunity. And I think it also had, it presented a lot of challenges for me and that I was suddenly found myself in a gallery where I was surrounded by painters that were extremely refined in their technical virtuosity as painters, you know, and boy, I mean, they're all painters that I really admire and uh, look up to their skill and technique, like painters like Will Wilson, Jacob Collins, and the list is, is very long. And as I, you know, the first, my first trip into the gallery, I just think, you know, rather than feeling like empowered as a painter that, oh, here's this, this renowned gallery that's going to show my work. I always felt going in there, especially the first few years dropping off work, I always felt like very, like almost too humble, very insecure. Like I'm not, I'm not worthy. What am I doing here? (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And also it caused me to, to maybe be really uptight in the studio because you, you take that experience of feeling small and not worthy and you go back to your studio to make more paintings and you're thinking, Oh God, I really gotta, I really gotta push it like 110%. And, and now you're thinking about specific paintings that you've seen and not just that you're thinking about presentation like what kind of frame and maybe things which are silly you know uh, and i think that bred into me a kind of a lot of unnecessary nervousness and insecurity but i would i would go back to velasquez as a big hero because he one day you know after many years of this kind of insecurity and feeling small i think looking at Velasquez both in you know in books and and in the museum and you see his work up close and you realize gosh he's just really he's really comfortable and at ease and he's not worried and he's you could just tell he's not concerned what other people think and he's definitely not concerned about is the painting neat and clean and refined i mean when you look in Velasquez's paint you see like dirt and schmutz <laughs> and and drips and you can see places where he's wiped his brush on the side of the painting to clean it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so he kind of was this glimmering voice of confidence that came through and said, Hey, you know, just don't worry about that so much. You know, you don't have to be as slick and as tight as these other painters, just be yourself. And I think the moment I started doing that, you know, I started enjoying my, my experience showing it with John Pence a lot more. Oh, that's so interesting. Cause that's what I was going to ask you is how did you get, get past that that feeling that you didn't, you didn't belong there. Yeah, it was, I think it was just simply going, you know what, I really can't be these other painters. You know, it just, it, the work doesn't come out well when I try to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't enjoy myself when I'm painting, when I'm trying to do that. And just, you know, you really just have to do what's natural and embrace that. Yeah. It's so interesting that we, it's such a hard thing to do, I think for people to, let go of that worry about what other people think or how they might look or just that whole thing. And people, doesn't matter if you're an artist or not, but, but just as human beings, we enslave ourselves with that. And there's so much freedom in just saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to trust myself. Yeah. And I'm going to trust everybody else (laughs) that if I am myself, that, everything will be okay. And that, you know, the pain, in in fact, it'll be better because you'll be happier. You'll be more secure. You'll have more fun. You'll be able to explore more. You'll 
dive down paths that you never would have. You'll create these epic multi-figure paintings because you saw this great show and now you know that that's what you need to do, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I think, I think authenticity is the thing. I, when you, when you relax, as you're saying, the work is far more authentic, you know, it feels f- more real and more just from your guts. And that, I think that transcends everything else. You know, the, the fact that it feels genuine and authentic. I'm, I'm really wary of both in myself and in colleagues and in students. There's this dangerous moment, I think, that we take as painters where we say, and I see this a lot in grad students and, and who can blame them, but I see them, they basically sit down and have a private moment with themselves where they say, what can I do to make my work more fashionable and more intriguing to the current art scene? You know, and, and uh, well, we kind of make a big splash or a big shock statement to the world that will get me some recognition. And I think very often the answers to those questions are things that lead an artist away from themselves. And they come upon these solutions to that question that aren't the best solutions, I think. So I, I'm always wary of that in myself, whether it's about content or maybe even technique. And I think showing with John, there is an example of technique where I thought, oh, I should really tighten up my, my painting skills. And I, I mean, tighten up my, my presentation, you know, how polished, how blended, how refined, mm. what level of realism am I aiming for? And it wasn't from myself. It was from, it was from some feeling of, of obligation or something like that. Oh, that's really funny. I remember somebody once told me that they thought my painting was sloppy. And this when I was in in college. And it stuck in my head. And for years after that, I'd always be like, Oh, it's so sloppy. It's so sloppy. I can't do that. It's so sloppy. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And you be it's like it's like when a a child with with issues about their parent parenting, you know. Right. And and the funny thing is I don't even remember who it was that told me that. Or, you know, like it could have been an instructor, it could have been a, a teacher, it could have been some some guy walking down the hall that has, no, you know, like, and why that statement became so powerful. It's really, I'm really fascinated by that. I know your paintings well. So I think it's interesting, though, that like what maybe was, I, I wasn't there to see it, but maybe what was sloppy at one point has now become very painterly. You know, that's a much better word. And that's something that, you know, we strive for. So and I love your the painterly quality in your landscapes. And um, so in a way, that was a good thing that if, if, if your paintings were sloppy. They've obviously matured to sort of blossom into what they're supposed to be. Yeah. And I think, thank, well, thank you. And I, but I think that the interesting thing is how, you know, like as artists, we, we pull in all these, these little hangups or whatever. <laughs> and, yeah. and the thing usually, you know, when you were talking about these artists thinking about what can make them more fashionable, what can make them, what they're really asking is, how can I stand out? How can I get noticed? That's right. That's exactly the question. And the answer is so it's to me, it's so simple, but it requires a lot of hard work. The answer is do great work. Be yourself, put yourself out there. Don't become a cookie cutter of some other artist that is, you know, that that you can never be because you've never. Nobody can be you and you can't be anybody else. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think when I have the chance to visit and talk with graduate students, because I often go to the New York Academy for like a a visiting workshop or just to be a a guest critic, I try to tell all of them to remember what is it that really excited you about making painting in the first place? Like, why did you come here? Maybe ask that question. Remember what your visions were in your head at that moment. What did you dream that your paintings would look like at that time? And then make, make work the names for that, you know, and, and maybe don't set your sights on how can I be famous? Cause I see a lot of grad students doing that right now. Oh, wow. That's dangerous. <laughs> oh, it's very dangerous, but they all, they all do it, you know, and, and especially in New York, you know, you've got like Chelsea right there, you know, and it's like so alluring that they, they often kind of get pulled into that, into that route. It's, yeah. it's very seductive. Yes, it is. Yeah. I'm just, I got distracted because I actually went to, to the Academy and was thinking about going there and then chickened out at the last minute. So as you're talking about it, I was oh, like, you did? huh. Oh, <laughs> no, I, uh, you know, the New York Academy is, is a wonderful place. I, you know, I both, I, I graduated from there with, for my graduate program and then I returned and taught there for two years. 
and I just love the students there. You know, they're, they're so great. And I, when I teach there or have the chance to visit there, it just, everything goes click, you know, my teacher side goes click. Yeah. I feel like what I have to offer and what the students need are just like a great match. And yeah, it's, it's, it's really inspiring being there and to see what the students are doing. And then you're surrounded by wonderful faculty. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's a, I mean, the faculty is uh, just is amazing, but then also the, the place itself, it's just a beautiful setup. It is. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's got a real ambiance to it. Well, next time you're in the area, you should definitely stop in, you know, and they, I mean, they have visitors coming, going all the time, all different, different types of visitors. So, but you're in Santa Cruz now, is that right? Yeah. I, when I left graduate school and I left New York, I, I didn't necessarily intend to, but I landed in Santa Cruz and I found some teaching work right away which, which was like, um, you know, I didn't expect that to happen so quickly and it snowballed into more and more teaching work at the university or are you doing it on your own? Yeah. At the university at UCSC, university of California, Santa Cruz, and then a lot of other colleges in the Bay area, uh, teach at a lot of different schools that drive around, um, you know, commuting and yeah. Although a lot of times it's, it, I can fit my teaching days onto you know, just a few number of days a week and the majority of the week I can be in the studio, which is nice. But it's here in Santa Cruz is, uh, is where my studio is. That's right. I love Santa Cruz. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful place. Tell me about your, your studio practice. I would love to hear how you work. Do you bring models in? Describe that to me. Yeah, I do. I, my process, and, I, and I'm actually writing about the process right now. I'm doing an article for a magazine that'll come out in the next several months on the the kind of start to finish process. So basically it starts with really, you know, rough thumbnail sketches that kind of slowly mature up to a certain state. And and when it's ready, I hire models to come in and start taking poses to match the poses that I've conceived of. So in other words, it starts off from invention, you know, sort of imagining, well, what could this pose do and how could these figures fit together? And then, and then it gets improved with observation of the model. And these days, I, I have been allowing myself to work from photographic reference a lot because I can get the models to match poses that I conceive of that are, that are maybe difficult to hold from life. Mm-hmm. So I get more dynamic poses. And that's, I think that's one of the big reasons why an artist might choose to, to work from photograph. I was definitely a heavy stickler about working only from life for many years. I think for about 15 years, I didn't, you know, I was very dogmatic and I was very much on the side of the argument that, uh, no, it's got to be from life. You know, an artist who works from photograph, it's just not the real thing. And, and I've heard, you know, I've talked to so many artists about this topic and certainly heard it spoken about. I know like Stuart Schills, who I'm very in awe of his paintings, but I know Stuart Schills is like very anti photograph. But I think that Having been on both sides of the argument of that idea about working for models in the studio versus some work from models in the studio and some photographic reference or all photographic reference, I think I've been on both sides of the of the fence now. And what I notice is that for me, having put many years into working from life only, I interpret the photograph in ways that are different from like copying from photograph. And you know, you could really see a, a, like a student who you know maybe doesn't doesn't know the difference. You can, you can look, see the difference in the work that they're maybe copying instead of interpreting. How did you feel when you made the switch? Honestly, I felt liberated. It, I felt like things were kind of like all the engines were firing now because I had been, I had tuned my eye to look and to read and interpret from life. But now I had the, you know, I had the benefit of the photographic reference there, like being able to have poses that were more dynamic action oriented. And of course, things like logistical things, like not, not having to worry about the model showing up or not showing up that day. Mm, mm -hmm. And also holding those poses. Those are, those are hard. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that was really liberating in in many ways. And I noticed, I I was going to say, I feel like for me, I didn't, I don't see a, a difference or feel a difference when I'm working from life or when I'm working from a photograph. And I think that's that's an important distinction to make for for a painter is it should feel that way if you're gonna if you're gonna use photos it should feel like the same feeling when you're painting when you're looking from life when you're looking at a photographic reference the feeling that you have when you're painting it yeah like it it shouldn't be like oh this is very different you know it's it's I think your mind should be interpreting both things in the same way do you think it changed you know other than the fact that you're able now to do these really 
dynamic poses in, in your work? Do you think it changed your work making that shift? Yeah, it did. It it very much did. And and like it, again, it just felt liberating to suddenly be able to say, "Oh, I can I can do this painting now because I don't have to worry about the model not being able to hold that pose." It also feels like when I when I conceptualize or compose uh, a painting from scratch, you come up with these ideas in the painting that even as you're composing them, you're thinking in the back of your mind, "There's no way the model's ever going to be able to hold this pose." And I think if you're one of these painters where it's like, bad, but I got to work from life only. So now let me alter that composition so that it can accommodate a model posing in the studio. Mm -hmm. Now you're compromising your artistic dream and your vision. So I don't, I don't think that's a good thing. I guess an artist has to make a distinction as to, are they a perceptual painter? Are they, are their paintings about like what they see? And that's a beautiful thing. You know, I think like Stuart Schultz does that really well. Hollis Dunlap's paintings do that really well. He's one I really admire and look up to, like Diarmuid Kelly as a British painter. Yeah, his work is Beautiful. amazing. Yeah, yeah, and and these painters, you know, there you can see that the the paintings and the beauty of them is about the language of the lens of the eye seeing and responding, and and it's awesome. But then I think, okay, let's talk about two other big heroes of mine are Vincent Desiderio and Bo Bartlett. And mm-hmm. these guys, these guys are more, you know, there is an element of that at play in their work for sure, the visual response. But it's much more about the narrative and the picture. You know, I mean, Vincent's even said that to me directly that, you know, he's much more interested in making a picture. So I guess you have to, you have to figure out where you fall in that spectrum. And and if the answer is that you're more interested in the narrative content, then I think that photographic references are going to be an important part of your process for sure. Mm, mm -hmm. That's a good point. It's interesting because I came also from that, you know, you do not use photographs. Yes. That was definitely part of, part of my background. And so I was also very highly resistant and felt guilty when I did and felt like Mm -hmm. it was cheating and that it wasn't real and blah, blah, blah. But I think, I think, yeah, I think the other side of it is, well, this technology exists. So, you know, and these are, these are tools that we can use. I think the problem happens when photography becomes a crutch. I think the problem is when you don't understand what you're looking at well enough to, to respond to the image that's the idea that's being photographed as opposed to this, you know, the camera's interpretation of it, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The camera's interpretation. And and I, and I think uh, it's good for a painter to just kind of be, if they're gonna if they're gonna bring photography into their process, I think they should just be very wary of what the photograph is showing them. Like, don't don't just say, oh, well, it's a photograph, so it must be right. You know, I think I think you should say, uh, you look at the photograph and say, well, maybe. <laughs> you know, right. like you you don't really trust what it's showing you, and you consider, you know, well, what's it showing me here? And you're sort of skeptical about it. And you, you rely more on your memory of the way light behaves on form and about anatomy. And you try to draw from your experiences working from life to help you improve what that photograph is, is telling you. Right. And that's, that's the key right there is, is relying on your memory and experiences. And the obvious thing behind that is that you you have a memory of working from life and you did it enough that it's sort of ingrained in you and you can see where the camera's lying or you can see where it's not what you want it to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think another important realization I made one day after I've been working with photographic references for a while is that I would come in, sit down at the painting, I would start painting, you know, 45 minutes to an hour would go by. And then I would like turn to maybe look at the photographic reference and remember that I never brought it out. Like I had been painting for an hour without looking at the photo. And that happens all the time. You know, I'll, or even if the photo's there, I'll find myself working on a section of the painting for, for 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And I realize I haven't looked at the photograph in a long time. And it, it's just more about the painting. You know, you're looking at the painting and responding to that. And you're asking yourself what's best for the painting, or you're trying to solve an answer about the way the light behaves on the form. And, and you're drawing upon your memory of, of that. So I want to ask you a practical question because I know I will I will get this. I will get emails about this. Okay. Where do you find your models? How do you pick your models? Well, for me it's been very easy because I get to be a professor. Aha, uh-huh. yes. It just they <laughs> fall into your they fall into your life without yeah. having to do anything. And 
they come through in a way where they automatically know you and trust you and have already heard of you. And they're usually really flattered if you ask them to pose for you privately. You don't have to worry about coming across like a creep or something like that. Yeah, I, I think in, in most of my models have been, not all, but most of them have been models that were posing in a class of mine. In a few cases, they have been friends, you know, long, long-term friends. Recently, I've been, I've been using my, my, I call her my almost wife because we're getting married in six weeks. So congratulations. Oh, thank you. Very excited. She's been in a lot of the paintings recently. So definitely family members and, you know, my spouse there, they've become, they recently have become a, a lot of my choices for modeling. But yeah, a lot has been uh, studio models that I've met in yeah. here in Santa Cruz in the San Francisco Bay Area, New York, LA, all over. In one case, I actually, I, it was like one of the only times where I approached the man who was teaching my yoga class in, in New York City. And, you know, I'm, I'm watching him go through all these yoga postures and I can see his physique and I think, oh my gosh, he's going to be an amazing model. <laughs> you know. know. Yoga classes are so awful for artists because you're like, whoa, that's a great pose. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's, and you can, you know, embarrass yourself by staring at someone too long. Mm -hmm. And he ended up being a, a model for me. I, you know, I approached him one day after class and, and, you know, asked him if he would feel comfortable. And he was, he was really uh, ready and willing to pose. And I have several paintings of him now. So yeah, I think that's the only case where I approached somebody that wasn't known to me as a model. Yeah. I mean, the flip side of it is it's got to be really hard. I mean, if you are a model and you're in your modeling, in a way, you're taking a big risk going to somebody's art studio because you don't really know what you're walking into and you're committing right. to be hours alone with this person. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the flip side, it's like you also need to find somebody who can who can hold a pose for a long time. And I think people who aren't either – at least this is – I haven't been doing figure painting in a very, very long time, so this isn't – but to me, it feels like dancers and, and yoga instructors mm -hmm. are the best models because they can, they, are. they understand their body and they understand what it means to hold a pose and the, they can anticipate how difficult something will be. And Yeah. Yeah. And they, they have what I call gestural flow in their poses. So a lot of times you just ask them to take a pose and they're already aware that that, that static pose needs to have this fluid rhythm to it. And they're going to they're going to build that into the pose without even having to like discuss that idea with them. So that's why they, a lot of those dancers and yoga practitioners make great models. Also, I think if you're interested in anatomy as a figure painter, which, which I am for sure, then they often have the best examples of that. Although I, I have to say, I mean, I love painting the figure in any, any manifestation. You know, I mm -hmm. think that you study the skeleton and the muscular system intimately and you learn all of that and and then suddenly you get a you know a really obese model with where none of the definition shows and and they're like the most exciting thing up on the model stand and yeah it just i think it just for me at least and you know again i, w I would never ever describe myself as a figurative painter in that sense because it's but it just makes you fall in love with like the human being you know like first you're i mean you're looking at it very analytically so it must yeah. be also uncomfortable for the model because you're just mentally taking them apart. Right. But the other thing is it also just makes you fall in love with all the different shapes of that human beings come in. Like, I think it's just yeah. so beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it really changes your idea of what beauty is. And, and, you know, we, we're all aware of our, what the, the cultural ideas of beauty and perfection should be, you know, we're supposed to be in good shape and muscular and skinny and, and athletic. And, and then when you see not that on the model stand and it's really beautiful and then and you're you're actually like trying to get that on your drawing or your canvas. You're trying to recreate their body. Suddenly, that's perfect. You know, it's like, well, that's the perfect thing that I'm trying to get. You feel the irony of that where you think, well, you know, society's telling me I'm supposed to have a flat stomach. And then here I'm drawing somebody who's got the opposite. And that's what I'm going for in this work of art. <laughs> it's like it really turns everything on your on its head about your idea about the the human body and beauty surrounding the human body. So it's a real game changer. It is. What single habit do you think strongly contributes to your, it can either be your success or, or your continued growth, however you want to interpret that? I, I think that because it occurred to me one day, sort of in a, a moment of frustration and or a moment of feeling disappointed at you know, where I was with my process or my career or all of the above. 
which, you know, as we're all prone to those moments. And I, I get emails from students all the time asking me like, well, I feel like I'm not good enough and what should I, I do? And so I'm constantly like a therapist and art therapist in, in emails to my students and they want to know what they should do. And I point out to them, look, you might be halfway there, but you've come too far to turn back. So to answer your question entries, that just the idea that I've invested way too much time and effort in my life to turn back now has kept me moving forward, even through moments when I'm feeling like unsatisfied with where I'm at, either technically or career wise or in the content of the work. I just there's this kind of prevailing voice that says you're going to keep going. You know, you're going to keep going. So you just kind of tell that that side of yourself to just shut up and <laughs> You know, you acknowledge you you're have, not fooling anybody. <laughs> yeah. You say, what, are you going to quit? What are you going to do? Quit? You know, that kind of, you, you have to tell yourself that. And, and then, and then it's kind of funny. You laugh at yourself. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm what am I, I'm not going to stop painting, you know? Yeah. And then the other question that, that comes right after that, as soon as you say that to yourself is you say like, well, okay. And what would happen if I just keep going? Like, wh- where will I be in 10 years if I don't stop, if I don't slow down? what will my work look like then? Like, it's definitely not going to be the same. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's bound to have improved. A lot of things will probably have happened to me by then, both good and bad. And, you know, I need to find out what those things are. So I think that is a prevailing habit that I've had since the beginning. And and I've I've been really serious about drawing and painting since I was very small. And, you know, like fifth, sixth grade, it became pretty solidified for me that I wanted to go to art school and pursue it. So, and it was always just this voice that, you know, I'm not going to stop. And I might go through periods of making poor work or bad work or, or feel lost in my process, but I'm just going to keep going. And I'm bound to pass through some moments of confusion and feeling lost, but I'm also bound to pass through like these really sublime parts of my career and my, and my, my experience of being a painter. Uh, yeah, so that's, I think that's what I would, how I would answer that question. It's a great answer. And I love, see, I've always thought of it in terms of my next question is typically what would my life be like if I stopped and it just feels like a death, you know? Mm-hmm. So that inspires me to keep going. But I like the, what, what will it be like in 10 years from now? Yeah. If I keep going. Yeah. yeah. If I keep going, because it's kind of in some ways easy to answer. If you look back 10 years, right, you can right. see how much you've grown. That's right. Yeah. You can see how much you've improved, not just in your practice, but then you can look at your career and say, oh, look what happened 10 years. I, you know, I hadn't had that solo show. I hadn't had that write up in that magazine or newspaper, you know, and all these like really exciting things for a painter. They happen if you just keep going, but you got to get through these dark times. You know, I, a student just wrote a frustrated email to me asking what they should do. And I said, you know, you really, you really have to push some, some technical training for the next two or three years. And I said, but, you know, you're by far not a beginner. And I said, so if you were taking a road trip from San Francisco to L.A. by car, I said, I would say right now you're in Colorado Springs. And, you know, I said, look at a map. And you'll see it's like you're just about halfway. And that means you're too far to turn back. You know, it's like it would just be disastrous to turn back. But there's definitely a road ahead and it's got to be travel, you know. So that's how I think about it sometimes. I love it. Noah, thank you so much for this conversation. Oh, thanks, Entries. I'm just like so honored and thrilled to be to be on Savvy Painter. You've interviewed a lot of my heroes and it's very humbling to be amongst them. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Show notes for this episode are on SavvyPainter.com. Just click on the podcast tab to see some of Noah's paintings. And he was kind enough to share the painting that he's currently working on. So definitely check that out because it is impressive. You can also get links to all of the artists and resources that we talked about. Again, that's at SavvyPainter.com forward slash podcast. Savvy Painter, Gamblin, Artist Colors, and Trakel Art Supplies are teaming up together to do our first online art competition. Artist Carol Marine will be jurying the show. You might remember that Carol was a guest on The Savvy Painter. She's a painter herself and the founder of DailyPaintworks.com. 
First place winner will receive $500 in merchandise from both Gamblin and Trakel, plus a cash prize of $250. But that's not all. The first place winner will also be a guest on the Savvy Painter podcast. So if you win first prize, you get your work in front of tens of thousands of people, a thousand dollars worth of art supplies to paint to your heart's content and some cold hard cash. Entries are being accepted from now until October 29th, 2017. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the Call to Entries tab for more information. I can't wait to see the great work that you submit. Good luck. I want to send a big thank you to those of you who support the podcast. This podcast would not be possible without the help of listeners like you. Does that sound a little NPR-ish? Maybe. Jasmine Allegar, Srivana Nara, Jiyoung Kim Studio, Gabrielle McDermott, The Roaring Artist, Don Chandler, Carla Roth, Virgil Dyson, Kenneth Burke, Maureen Nathan, The Kathy Beeler, Alexis Redden, Christine Curtin, Gail Height, Art of Joy, and the one and only Barry Koplowitz, who I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing his name correctly because... In all the time that he has been supporting this podcast, he has not once complained about how I say his last name. Thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Listening.